The countdown clock is ticking here, and and no, this is not a biological clock, a time bomb, or a digital countdown of how much longer your electric toothbrush will scrub your choppers. It's a countdown to the end of a special bonus, when a donation to Big Picture Science will be doubled. Doubled, as in Romulus and Remus, or maybe Mary-Kate and Ashley. Every dollar that you, valued listener, donate will be matched by the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Now, that's more leverage than a high-profile buyout. So uh, while we tee up the next episode of the show here, mouse over to bigpicturescience.org, punch the obvious button, and keep Big Picture Science ticking over. are your brain, your big buddies. You and your brain are so close, you're really one and the same. There's no way your best friend would keep something from you. But what if I told you that brain has a hidden agenda, that some of your behavior is driven by impulses that your conscious mind doesn't recognize? This might happen when brains aren't working properly, sure, but even when they are. Either way, are you sure you're in control? And yet, you are your brain. So who or what else could be at the driver's wheel? I'm Seth Shostak and Seth Shostak's brain. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, your hidden brain. It can drive you to commit acts that are unspeakable and also quite mundane, all without your conscious awareness. The legal system has seized on this and has launched a new field of neuroscience and the law. But even a healthy brain can drive its owner to unhealthy behavior. You may be shocked, as I was, to learn just how much of your time is spent on a smartphone or other device. Find out why your brain finds digital devices irresistible. Plus, why even ho-hum decisions about what color socks to wear may be beyond your conscious control. It's your brain's reins. If you look in the mirror, you recognize yourself. Maybe not first thing in the morning, but all other times of day, you know your own mug when you see it looking back at you. But how well do you know the engine behind that goofy grin? How well do you know your own brain? It's a question at the heart of the story of Herbert Weinstein, a 65-year-old New Yorker who got caught up in a series of bizarre events in 1991. Herbert Weinstein had led an exemplary life He was an advertising salesman for most of his career. He raised a family in suburban New Jersey. He was smart, he was engaging, he was known for his calm demeanor. Then one night in January, the police were called to an apartment building on the Upper East Side. Well, the police went to the building on 72nd Street. This was on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a pretty well-to-do area. And a doorman had told them there was a white-haired man walking around the lobby, sort of suspicious, and he'd gone back up to his apartment. It turned out it was Herbert Weinstein, and when the police asked if they could talk to him for a little bit, he invited him into his apartment, and under questioning, and it didn't take too long, he had confessed to having strangled his wife and thrown her out the window after they had gotten engaged in an argument. So here's this middle-aged guy, an ad executive, no history of violence, and one night he strangles his wife and throws her out the window. He told the police exactly what happened. They had noticed he had a scratch under his eye, and Weinstein explained that he and his wife had been arguing. This is his second wife, by the way. His first wife had died of cancer. They had been arguing about their grown children. He had called Barbara's daughter a brat, and she had called his son overweight and made jokes about his weight. And so Weinstein decided he was just going to be calm and not argue anymore, but it enraged Barbara so much that she swiped at him and scratched him in the eye. Weinstein told the police that all of a sudden he just couldn't control himself and he put his hands around her throat and he began squeezing and squeezing and squeezing until she fell limp. Now Weinstein panicked at that time, so he he dragged her to the bedroom window, he opened it up, propped her up, and threw her out. Apparently Weinstein thought that he would make it look like a suicide. 
The fact that he killed his wife and attempted to cover it up suggests he was rational and he knew right from wrong. However heinous his crime, he seemed to have presence of mind and be in control of his actions. Still, something about Herbert Weinstein's behavior didn't sit right with his attorney. After he had been arrested and charged with murder, Weinstein hired a very good lawyer named Dermot White in New York. And like any good lawyer, White decided to pursue all avenues. He thought, you know, this was so unusual about Weinstein, and his demeanor seemed to be so flat, and he seemed to be so unaffected by what happened, he decided to send him for some psych tests. The psych test didn't really reveal anything unusual, but there was still some suspicion that something was wrong with Weinstein. So he went in for a CAT scan, and when that image came back, what they saw on that screen was a cyst, and it was the size of an orange, and it was right over his left frontal lobe. And when his lawyer saw that, he said, aha, I have now got a defense. The case of Herbert Weinstein's brain cyst became a milestone for what kind of scientific evidence could be used in court. I'm Kevin Davis, author of The Brain Defense, Murder in Manhattan and the Dawn of Neuroscience in America's Courtrooms. Kevin Davis tells the story of how brain abnormalities came to be a mitigating factor when defendants are charged with violent crimes and how the idea of determining culpability from a brain scan is still debated today. Now, we won't give away how the Herbert Weinstein case ended, but how it began illustrates one of the first times that neuroscience took the witness stand. This was after Mr. Weinstein was discovered to have lived years of his life not knowing that a baseball-sized cyst was present on the frontal lobe of his brain. The first scan was just an image that showed like a big black void where that cyst was. What his lawyer had done was some research to learn about uh, PET scans. Now, PET scans, positron-emitted tomography, show brain activity. So when Weinstein had a PET scan, it showed a reduced activity in his left frontal lobe. Now, the left frontal lobe is an area uh, of executive function and impulse control. So it was that scan, the PET scan, that was the controversial piece of evidence that the lawyers battle over during Weinstein's trial. Okay, well, <laughs> how much of your personality or your ability to make good decisions or whatever else are controlled by that frontal lobe in your brain? I mean, is, is this a part of the brain that could have affected his behavior in this way, that he would strangle his own wife and throw her out the window? Well, that's exactly what the question was. Now, it's been long established that damage to the frontal lobe and damage to other parts of the brain, for that matter, can result in profound changes in personality and loss of impulse control. Now, not everybody who has brain damage necessarily becomes homicidal or murders their spouse, but there is a history of that, and it goes all the way back to a famous case that those who are interested in neuroscience may know of, which is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was the railroad worker who, back in the 1840s, had suffered a horrific on-the-job accident. Gage was tamping some explosives with a tamping iron, and a spark went off. And the tamping iron shot like a rocket, and it went through his eye, through his brain, and out of the back of his skull and landed a few feet away. So not only did Gage survive this accident, he was actually talking to people as he was being carted off for medical care, but he suffered severe and profound personality changes after that accident. And that was a time when physicians and researchers realized that the frontal lobe, which was the area that was mostly damaged, could be tied directly to these kinds of behavioral and personality issues. Now, the larger question here, of course, is the matter of the justice system. The justice system will weigh in on an accused criminal on the basis of right from wrong, that there's some sort of generalized definition of what's right and what's wrong, don't kill somebody, you know, that society defines. And people can be assumed to have some sort of responsibility. So there is this fundament of law that says, you know right from wrong, you did the wrong thing, so we're going to punish you for it. Uh, but on the other hand, you are your brain. That's what the neuroscientists will say. And if your brain is somehow compromised by injury or something like that, doesn't that sort of undermine the entire assumption here in the justice system? Not necessarily. So if you look at the law, and especially the law regarding insanity, insanity is a very, very difficult case to prove. It's, um, it's rarely used and even more rarely succeeds. And it addresses those very issues that you just mentioned. 
Does a person understand the difference between right and wrong? Does a person appreciate the consequences of their actions? If those questions can be answered or variations of them, then the person is not legally insane. Where things start to differ is not whether the person is guilty or not guilty, but to what extent do we hold them accountable for their crimes? Do we offer them lesser sentences? Do we offer them mental health treatment? Those are the things that I think are more importantly addressed with this brain defense, rather than a matter of determining whether someone is to blame or guilty or not guilty, is how do we find a place in the criminal justice system that both holds people accountable for what they do, but also protects society from dangerous people as well. Kevin, how long has this precedent for not convicting the insane or others suffering psychological maladies, or at least convicting them in the same way to the same sort of punishment, how, how long has that been around? I mean, th does this go back into ancient history or is this something fairly new? No, it does go back into ancient history. As a matter of fact, when the Greeks created a court system, they created a court system in which they sought to understand the whys of why people committed crimes, but also a system that was less based on a thirst for vengeance and one that's more humanistic. Now, there have been severely mentally ill and psychotic people as long as there have been human beings. And a lot of us can recognize that without even any sort of official medical diagnosis, and that's even going back to the times of the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks saw and recognized that if someone was clearly suffering from a disease or defect of the mind, that they should not be held accountable to the same degree as their mentally healthy counterparts. So it stretches way back. And then from there, and mostly in Europe, um, laws were created, including um, laws about the insanity defense that addressed this very thing. And so this does have a long um, history and controversial history, as you can imagine, because some people think the insanity defense is simply a way to get criminals off. But we've seen in some cases, very few, however, that insanity is truly a medical diagnosis in which somebody really cannot control themselves. There is a precedent that does seem to be effective in terms of uh, defense on the basis of uh, limited if you will, mental awareness of what you were doing or uh, realizing the importance of what you were doing, and that is being young. Children up to the age of, I don't know, 18 or so are considered less culpable than those that are older. And again, I think that's an ancient idea. Is it simply because they have a better chance of changing their behavior in the future that, you know, they still have promise, or is it because their brains are different? I think it's both. As a matter of fact, in the last decade, the U.S. Supreme Court eliminated the death penalty for juveniles. They've also eliminated life without parole for juveniles. And part of the reason was this was supported by neuroscience. Neuroscience shows that the human brain does not fully develop until about the age of 25. So there is a lot of development still going on in the young brain at that time, which suggests that there still could be promise and hope for rehabilitation. You know, we all know that teenagers and young kids, you know, act impulsively. I mean, we've seen it. It's observable. The neuroscience has basically confirmed that. And so we have moved away from treating young criminals as adults, and I think rightly so. Well, finally, Kevin, uh, as science progresses, it seems inevitable that it will be brought to bear in the courtroom more and more. So I just kind of wonder, should I be advising young people not to study law, but study neuroscience. Well, you can advise them to study both because, uh, as a matter of fact, programs that combine law and neuroscience are springing up around the United States. There's a uh, center at Vanderbilt University where you can get a dual PhD and JD in law and neuroscience. Uh, I believe there's a program at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, Fordham University now has a center on law and neuroscience. So around the country, people are recognizing that this intersection of law and neuroscience is going to be a growing field and an important field. I think it's still very early and very nascent, but I think bringing science and law together creates a lot of conflict, but I think over time they're going to find common ground because science is so exact. Laws about prescribing sets of ideas and circumstances in which people are held accountable, I'm speaking of criminal law, I think it's a very exciting field, and there's a, a lot of research going on in this area, and we're going to see more to come. 
Kevin Davis, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you so much for having me. Kevin Davis is the author of The Brain Defense, Murder in Manhattan and the Dawn of Neuroscience in America's Courtrooms. A physical injury, a disease, may produce obvious pathology. Your brain is sick. But what if your brain is healthy? Could natural impulses still find a way to drive you to maladaptive behavior? Well, I have in mind a young man, 22 years old, who has failed out of college. He has failed out of the job that he held while he was in college, never dated, not interested in eating, losing weight, getting really no exercise, so no muscle development. What this 22-year-old man was doing instead of sleeping, eating, dating, and graduating from college was playing video games, continuously and compulsively. We'll hear how he learned to use technology in moderation and how technology companies are conspiring against him by design next. It's Your Brain's Reigns on Big Picture Science. When internet use becomes obsessive use, one option for users is to press the reset button. My name is Hillary Cash, and I am co-founder and chief clinical officer for Restart. Hillary Cash's program Restart is an internet addiction recovery program with a campus specifically for adolescents in Washington State, east of Seattle. Most of her clients are young men who are smart and who are on the verge of having productive, fulfilling lives until their attention is diverted. Most of our guys have attempted college but failed out, and so the parents are feeling desperate because they can just see that it's not going to be successful going forward, that their son really does need help. When these young men come to you and you have a conversation with them, is it hard for them to sustain a conversation with another person looking at them and maintaining eye contact and everything else that's involved in having a a conversation that often is not a a clean business? It's often messy to to talk to someone else. (laughs) Yes. Do you find that? Well, there's a wide range of social skill level that I see in the guys. And the most extreme uh, sort of deficit guys have trouble even speaking in a very organized and coherent way. Most of them really don't know the skills of social conversation. Some of them really are poor at maintaining. A lot of them are uncomfortable maintaining eye contact. And they have often so little actual real-world experience that, you know, their experience is online and in-game. And so they don't really have much to talk about if it's not that. I listened to a testimonial from one of the mothers of one of your clients, and she said she was frustrated by others who would say, regarding her son's compulsion to play video games, that internet and gaming addiction is not a real thing, and at least he wasn't on drugs. Were they right? That message is a really common one because internet gaming disorder is not yet a full-fledged disorder in the DSM. But they are definitely wrong when they say that. This is a disorder which, like any other addiction, it ends up taking over a person's life. And people understand this about chemical addiction. The same actually exists in this situation as well. But here's the thing that's really hard for them, is that because most of them have invested so much of their lives in gaming, and they've been gaming since they were kids, Their identities are really built around being good gamers. And inside the game and inside that gaming community, they receive a lot of recognition. There are many, many things that are rewarding for them in this world, in this cyber universe that they have spent so much time in. And they really have built their identities and their self-esteem around that. So it is extremely extremely difficult. I mean, it's a painful grief process for them to have to give that up. 
Now, your treatment begins by taking away the digital technology, whether it's a cell phone or a computer, for, I believe, 45 to 90 days. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And this is the detox period. And I've heard you describe what's happening to the brain as it as it recovers from this addiction. And um, what is the brain doing during this time that it no longer has the digital technology to affix itself to? Well, with any addiction, the overstimulation of the brain in those regions that we sort of call the pleasure pathway leads to a down-regulating of the brain in its effort to operate normally. And we call that tolerance in the addiction world. And then when they are deprived of whatever it is that stimulates those regions, when they're deprived of that by coming here, it takes time for the brain to bring back the receptors that can pick up the neurochemicals involved, dopamine, opiates, and other neurochemicals, and that period is withdrawal. So during the withdrawal period, their brains are in operating in a deficit mode, and it's uncomfortable. People feel sometimes an increase in anxiety or depression, anger, irritability, restlessness, Uh, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, all of that's going on during that withdrawal period. But when it's completed and their brains have brought back normal levels of receptors to pick up normal levels of those neurochemicals, their thinking gets clear, they become relaxed, you know, all of those withdrawal symptoms start to go away. And so that's the process of going through withdrawal that we're looking for. Now, in addition to that, because these, uh, the vast majority of the young men who come here are missing uh, out, have missed out on the development of a lot of skills and habits that functional adults need. We're teaching them skills for regulating their emotions. They are usually have really missed out on a lot of social development, so we're teaching them social skills, communication skills, and we're trying to get them in the habit of good self-care of their bodies, regular showering, brushing their teeth, that sort of thing. And part of that is spent certainly outdoors. You have a lovely space, and I'm wondering what the role of being outdoors and this particular setting um, plays in your approach to treating video game addiction. There's actually mounting research, uh, which is summarized in a great book called This Is Your Brain on Nature. There's a growing body of research that that is demonstrating clearly. We are, let us not forget, animals. We are social animals, but we are part of nature. And we need to have a relationship to nature. We we become dysregulated. Uh, physiologically, emotionally, we become dysregulated when we don't have enough connection to nature and to one another. Hillary Cash, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Hillary Cash is the co-founder and chief clinical officer of Restart, an internet addiction recovery program. You'll find a link to her and the program on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Of course, it's not just young men engaging in compulsive online behavior. Just take a moment now to look up from your smartphone at the people around you on the subway or in the park or perhaps your own living room. Chins are down and eyes are fixed on handheld rectangles and children who don't yet have smartphones squirm while their parents gaze unblinkingly into their own. In just the last two decades, humans have cobbled together circuitry, displays, and batteries to create a technology as culturally transformative as the plow or the printing press. But with at least one difference, it's unlikely that either of those tools were purposely designed to tickle your brain into compulsory use. Pray, Basil, thy const plow in darkness cometh inside. I haveth victuals for thy supper. Nay, good wife, enjoyeth you my victuals. I goteth keepeth going. Every time good Bessie here and I maketh a new furrow, she ringeth her bell. I did wager Goodman Clarence two florins that I canneth get one hundred more rings than he before dawn. Go thither, Bessie, thither. But today's technology is designed from the get-go to keep you obsessively busy. 
It gives your brain what it most secretly desires. Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked is the latest book by Adam Alter, Assistant Professor of Marketing and Psychology at New York University Stern School of Business. I think the way they would couch this is in business terms, they're trying to make a product that's engaging, whether it's a game or an app or a social media platform, it doesn't really matter what it is. They're trying to make it as hard to resist as possible because that means advertising dollars. And also it's a competitive attentional marketplace. People only have so much attention to dish out and there's a lot of competition for that attention. So if you don't make the most hard to resist version of your product, it's likely to be passed over for something else, for one of its competitors. I wonder if you could share with us uh, the reaction of the actual designers and the degree to which they'll let their own children use some of these devices. Yeah, this was fascinating to me. This was very early on in my research into the book. I, I wondered, what do the people who create these platforms think of what they're doing? Some of them are oblivious, others are aware of it. And what's fascinating is that they will talk publicly about the virtues of their products. Um, Steve Jobs was a classic example. He talked about the iPad, for example, at, at uh, an Apple event in 2010. He described it as the best way to consume all sorts of different experiences from educational media to the web to videos to books. And uh, when he was interviewed a little while later by a journalist from the New York Times, he was asked, so your kids must love the iPad. It was almost a throwaway question. And his response was, we don't let them use the iPad. We don't bring it into the home. And that's not uncommon. There are a lot of tech giants, a lot of the titans of tech who publicly obviously claim their products are wonderful, but refuse to let their kids use them or use them with heavy restrictions. Let's look at how these devices are deliberately designed to hook the brain. And you write that if we want to design an experience that will get the brain hooked, there are a few components that will make that experience possible. You also call these the ingredients of irresistibility. Mm -hmm. Can you introduce us to one of them, please? Yeah, so the, the most powerful one, I think, is the kinds of feedback you get from any experience. Humans are feedback-seeking engines. We basically, from a very young age and right through our lives, want to act on the environment and to have the environment tell us that it's been acted upon. And that's why kids will go up to an elevator and push every button because the buttons light up or because they get a ding sound. They love that and they're curious about it and it's how we learn about and discover the world. And this, uh, this feedback works only as long as there's some unpredictability. You know, if you think about gambling and, and lotteries and things like that, the reason why people can't seem to stop playing them even when they're they just don't make much sense, they are not rational behaviors, is because they are hoping for that small chance of a great outcome to emerge. And that uncertainty in feedback is very hard for us to resist. And there's evidence from animals all the way down from rats all the way up to humans that this is true. Though to be fair to the rats, from their perspective, it might be <laughs> all the way down from humans, all the way up to rats. <laughs> That's true. They are pretty clever animals. They what are very do, clever. What do the animal studies show? When I talk about from rats all the way up to humans, I just mean in terms of their position in the cognitive hierarchy. And it's interesting that it doesn't matter where you are in that cognitive hierarchy. Rats may be simpler in terms of their behavior than humans, but like humans, if you put a rat in front of a button and the button lights up and they peck the button or they push the button with their noses, let's say that you have two different versions. You have a version where every 10 little pushes of the button leads to a small tray of pellets being delivered versus a case where it's unpredictable. The rats don't know how many times they have to push the button with their noses before they get food, and they also don't know how much food they'll be getting. When it's predictable, they'll keep doing that until they're no longer hungry, and then they'll stop and they'll just sit in their cages. If they don't know what sort of feedback they're gonna get, they will keep doing this way past the point of satiation when they're no longer hungry. So what you'll find is that the rat loves the anticipation and the uncertainty so much that he'll keep nudging the little button with his nose, even as the pellets pile up and he's not even eating them anymore. He's no longer hungry, but it's not about hunger. It's not about instrumental gain. It's about the sheer thrill of engaging in an experience that's unpredictable. Now you said that all humans want feedback. We want to feel like if, if we do something to the world, it'll let us know that something has been done. And, and you point to the kids who like to press elevator buttons. But, but Adam, I get that same effect if I open my refrigerator. A light comes on, and if I put something in the microwave, a ding goes off. Why am I not addicted to those experiences? I think because those rewards are A, predictable, and B, 
not not that great. Um, you know, when you open the fridge, when you open the fridge and you see your food there, a lot of people have ambivalent responses to that. But but imagine that every so often you opened your fridge and a gold bar happened to just be sitting in there, or your microwave, and you open the microwave and hey, there's ten thousand bucks. That experience would change how we responded to fridges and microwaves dramatically. Even if it were only one in every thousand times we opened, or one in every million times we opened the fridges and microwaves. Well, I want to look at the other ways in which these devices hook us, but to go down another path for just a moment, after reading about your experience using software to track your activity with your phone, I was curious about my own, so I downloaded an app from my phone and discovered that in less than one day, I opened the phone more than 50 times, and I've already spent more than an hour on it. And Adam, I can't even tell you what I've done with that hour. So I'm in I'm in shock, and I feel I feel a little queasy about it that I've already spent that much time, and I take it I'm probably not alone in this reaction. No, you are not alone. And what's really interesting is the creator of the app that I use. It's called Moment. The guy's name is Kevin Hollesh, and he he lives in Pittsburgh. He uh, d designed this app because he wanted to monitor his own behavior. And when he released a beta version to his friends, he asked them before they started using it to guess how much time they were spending on their phones. And the thing about that time is that it's almost invisible to us. We don't even realize we're picking up our phones now. It's become such a habit. So like you, they generally underestimated their usage by about half. Their estimates were half of the true number. I had a similar experience to yours. I started using Moment and I guessed that I was using my phone about an hour a day. I'm using my phone between two and a half and three and a half hours a day. <laughs> what are you doing? Which is, what are you doing? Uh, what am I doing? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I check email. I sit, uh, I stand by the subway platform in New York City and uh, that's some of that time is spent on my phone. And this doesn't even count the time you're using your phone to make calls. This is screen time. So when you add calls to that, depending on who you are, that can add a pretty big chunk of time. We really are hooked on these devices. I'm interested in your description of this experience that we may not recognize our own addiction. We don't know what it feels like. And since I learned that I have now looked at my phone almost 60 times in the last 24 hours, I don't feel like I got 60 hits of dopamine. I know there's some pleasure response here, but it doesn't feel like pleasure. Sometimes it just feels like irritation, but yet I, I keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's also typical of drug use or of uh, of any addictive <laughs> oh, no. behavior. Yeah, sorry, sorry to tie the two together, but uh, you know, that's tolerance in very clear view. That what happens over time is the same dosage just doesn't do quite the same thing for you, and then you end up needing to escalate to some extent, which is one reason why if you track how people use fitness watches or smartphones, their usage generally escalates over time. Um, to say a little bit more about that, though, with respect to smartphones, this isn't just about sheer pleasure. I think you can be hooked on a device that, that doesn't just have the, the effect of making you feel wonderful all the time. It can also just be something that you do instrumentally that becomes a habit, that becomes a form of comfort. People describe uh, gambling addicts who sit in front of slot machines, and, and when they describe them, they don't say that they're in ecstasy the whole time they're playing. They go into a sort of trance-like state and that in itself is addictive. That numbing ex sensation is addictive. It doesn't mean that you're experiencing every moment as, as ecstasy, but it's still something that you feel is very hard to stop doing. Well, you cite other factors that our digital devices employ to make them irresistible, and one is to create goals, even if the goals are artificial. And I am interested in your response in the news that the company Uber now has been reported by the New York Times recently to be using the very techniques that game designers use to keep their drivers, their Uber drivers, on the road. And one of them is to set these earning goals. That's a, it's a fascinating article by Noam Scheiber, who um, I spoke to actually before he, he wrote the piece. And we were, we were discussing some of these mechanisms because they are the very same. And one of the things he showed and found was that, that these artificial targets are always set just, just beyond reach. Another technique that Uber is using, uh, they borrow from Netflix, apparently, where they line up the next driver in the way that Netflix lines up the next video for you. So all you have to do is click and, you know, you continue the experience without stopping. Yeah, ex exactly. And th this, uh, th this general tendency is uh, to eradicate our so-called stopping rules. The way humans behave is we tend to just do the same thing until there's a good reason to stop. So there's inertia in our behavior. And what usually happens, if you think about traditional experiences, offline experiences, if you read the newspaper or you read a book or you watch an old school TV show, 
eventually there's a point where there's a natural ending. The episode ends and you wait till next week or you read the paper and it, the paper's done. There's nothing more to read. Those all are natural stopping rules that say maybe it's time to move on to the next thing. If you look at Uber, the way it is for drivers and for, for passengers to some extent as well, and if you look at the way uh, social media works, it's all bottomless. The way Netflix works, you go on to the next episode. All of these experiences eradicate those stopping rules so that it's much harder for you to intervene. If your natural tendency is to just keep doing what you're doing until you're given a cue to stop, you won't stop unless that cue arrives. Well, finally, Adam, how are video games different from a game like chess? Because using some of your criteria here, chess also gives you feedback, and you have a goal, and you have an unpredictable reward. You don't know whether or not you're going to win, right? You don't. Each game is different. How are they different? The biggest difference between them is that games and the platforms that exist and succeed on social media and on screens demand almost nothing of you. They demand very little, especially over time when you master them. They are numbing in a sense, and they bring rewards to you. They are in a competitive marketplace. Everyone's trying to compete for your attention, and they have to dominate on that front. So where you get the dinging bells and the bright colors on games like Candy Crush, Flappy Bird, Farmville, and so on, you get all these rewards popping up constantly. Chess is the opposite. There are no flashing lights and, and bells dinging. If you want to play chess, you better engage, and you'd better engage for a long time. You can't slack off, and... You can't have those periods, like when we read a book sometimes, we even need to read a page a second time because we tune out. Chess demands a lot from you. And for that reason alone, it's very different. Any experience that requires that much attention from you is in some ways, at least cognitively, very, very useful and beneficial. I would argue that most of the experiences we have online, the bad ones, as I'd call them, if we're going to call them that word, are not at all demanding. They bring everything to you. And as a result, they lower your threshold for boredom. And it's very easy to just get bored because they, they give you everything you need. Well, Adam Alter, thank you for speaking with us. And now I feel some incredibly strong pull to go home and open up my fridge and see if there's gold there or see <laughs> if there might be cash in my microwave. <laughs> Good luck. Let me know what happens. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Molly. Adam Alter is Assistant Professor of Marketing and Psychology at New York University Stern School of Business. His book, Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. Okay, so you limit your online use. You say you've got that under control. But who picked out that lovely fuchsia shirt you're wearing today? You or your brain? What if I said that soft, squishy mass under your scalp did long before you grabbed the eye popper from its hanger? Say hello to your unconscious. Now, can you outsmart it? It's your brain's reigns on Big Picture Science. So maybe you're thinking about now, well, I don't have a pathology and I'm not online very often. So my brain and I, we are simpatico, we are copacetic. I know what my brain wants, my brain knows what I want. Well, kind of, because your brain is looking out for you, that's true, but parts of it operate with an agenda of which you're not aware. We might presume that conscious thought is what prompts us to say what we do, to do what we do, who could imagine that we are driven by forces not accessible to our conscious mind? I am Peter Vishton. I'm a uh, psychologist, a psychological scientist at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Dr. Vishton says that, well, to put it bluntly, your brain is often on autopilot. Take that raisin bagel that you chose at the deli today. Well, the selection didn't begin with a conscious decision to opt for raisin over onion, he says. Not only was your unconscious running the show when you pointed to the raisin bagels, Dr. Vishton might argue that the action of selection preceded your conscious rationalization of it. In other words, first we act, then we think and the control we feel is an illusion. However, there is some good news. There may be a way to outwit your unconscious mind. Peter, uh, reading over your description of the hidden workings of the brain, I'm now getting a little paranoid wondering who is really in charge of Seth Shostak. 
Well, I think Seth is still in charge of Seth. I don't think anyone would argue that the thing controlling you is outside of your own head. It's still your brain that's in control. The thing that, that I've been thinking and talking a lot about recently is this notion that there are conscious thoughts you have in your head. You feel like your conscious decision making is in control, but there are lots of unconscious control systems, lots of things that we're never aware of that influence and in many cases actually dictate our actions. Okay, so is it my unconscious that's calling the shots and things that I think I'm deciding for myself? So it's hard to know. I think the kind of experiment that I think about a lot, the, uh, there was a famous study done by Alvaro Pascoleone where participants were given a really simple task. It's just they're sitting at a table and they're supposed, when they get their first cue, they're supposed to decide, are you going to move your right hand or your left hand? Then after a delay, they're given a go signal and then they move their right hand or their left hand. While they're doing this, there's a transcranial magnetic stimulator. It's a, a magnetic coil that can deliver a magnetic energy down through the scalp and the skull to the brain to actually make one of your hands move, right? So the, uh, the experimenter can in sort of has a remote control device to make the person perform a simple action. What Pascal Leone did then was to ask people to make their decision, which hand they're going to move, then a few moments later would deliver a pulse that would make the other hand move, right? So I, if I'm in this study, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, in a few seconds, I'm going to move my right hand. Then a few seconds pass and I get the signal and instead of my right hand moving, my left hand moves. That should feel weird, right? It should feel as if someone has taken over your body for a few moments. I think for me, the, the most fascinating part of that study is when you're a participant in that, you don't even notice that people just don't say anything. The, the experiment keeps going. Even when Pascalini presses them on this, when it'll say something like, gee, from your pattern of brain activity, it looked like you were going to move your right hand, but then you moved your left instead. They'll calmly say, oh, you know, it's interesting you say that. I did change my mind there at the last second. So what you're saying is that you think you're in control. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, this deep state, <laughs> if I could use that term, of the mm -hmm. mind, which is actually running the show, is so good at it, they've convinced you that they're not running the show. I think your conscious thought processes, they kind of go along for the ride, most of the time, actually. When you actually do something, those thought processes do two things. Uh, one, they take credit for it. Whatever you just did, they give us this powerful illusion of, oh, yeah, that you did that because I wanted to do that. The second thing they do is they'll make up a story about why you, you engaged in a particular action. Sometimes that's an accurate story, but in a variety of studies, there's really good evidence that the story we come up with for why we did something is often very disconnected from the things that actually caused it. Can you give me an example of that? My favorite example, you present someone with a, uh, a range of different options. In the classic study I'm thinking of, they were nylon stockings, right? There were seven pairs of nylon stockings that were laid out on the table in front of someone, and they were asked to pick which one was the best. It's a psychology experiment, so it's worth noting that they were all ex absolutely identical. In fact, the order was shuffled between participants just to make sure that, on average, they really were identical to one another. In that kind of a situation, people exhibit a right-side bias. They're far more likely to pick the stockings that are on the right side of the table than the left side. It's, there are a lot of reasons that might happen, which aren't particularly relevant, where most people are right-handed, we work from left to right, we read from, from left to right. The thing that uh, is interesting here that's really relevant, when you ask people why they chose the stockings, they don't tell you, I picked it because on the right. No one ever says that. Everyone will come up with a reason that, oh, this color looks just a little bit warmer than the others. The, the stitching on this one seems a little bit better. We come up with reasons for why we do things, but we can't really ever know for sure in a real-world context whether those reasons we've given are the things that actually drive the uh, choice behaviors. This is a little depressing. Isn't it an awful <laughs> lot for our subconscious brain to, or, by the way, is it subconscious or unconscious? What, what, what should I be using here? Uh, I, I prefer the term unconscious. I feel okay. like the subconscious has some theoretical Freudian baggage that goes with it, but they're, they're essentially synonymous here. It's that there are processes taking place that are outside of your conscious awareness that are important for dictating your behavior. All right. So isn't that an awful lot of things for my unconscious to keep track of? If I were the unconscious, I would, I suppose, limit my influence to the big things like breathing or liver function or, or maybe who I should marry and whether to press send after writing an impulsive email. I mean, for better or worse, those actions at least have real significance or even direct survival value. But what color shirt I wear or what socks I pick out, what's the evolutionary advantage of all this micromanaging? They're really valuable. 
it's really nice that, I don't know, when I get up in the morning, I head for the shower, and I really don't have to think about my morning preparations very much beyond that. It all happens largely on autopilot. That frees me up to think about what I'm going to do that day, um, you know, or maybe trying to solve some problem that, that I've been stuck on. It's nice that there is this enormous network of, of circuits in our brain that take care of a lot of things that we do repetitively. The conscious processing tends to get brought in, tends to focus on things where we haven't done the task before, where it's something that yeah, requires sort of the, the heights of our uh, rational, logical thinking. Is there any way I can countermand this? I mean, if I have listened to you and I know that this is happening, and my unconscious is telling me, pick that pair of socks over on the right, mm -hmm. can, can I, simply knowing that this is likely to be happening, can I kind of decide to pick some other pair of socks? Or does that lead to a kind of recursive problem where, you know, my unconscious has already dictated my skepticism and that I'm going to change my mind? There is a piece of it that's almost inescapable in that when you look at two pairs of socks sitting in the shelf in front of you there, if you have a gut decision a gut, that one of them just feels better than the other one, the more you think about it consciously, the more you'll tend to come up with reasons that simply support that initial gut reaction. We, in many cases, go with that gut unconscious choice and then support it with our conscious reasoning. There are places, though, where you can manage your unconscious reasoning better, like uh, modifying your eating behaviors. Our uh, decisions about when we're hungry and how much we want to eat, even what foods we're going to uh, we're going to pick up and eat, those are very much driven by unconscious processing in our brain. I often encourage people to think about it in terms of not that you're trying to change your eating behaviors yourself, but you're trying to change the eating behaviors of this other entity that's living there in your head, this other, almost your inner two-year-old, this inner two-year-old who loves sugar and fat and doesn't really care about fitness and, uh, and healthy eating and things like that. The one that's probably easiest to describe is eating off of smaller plates. So if you give someone a, uh, a plate and they, they serve themselves some food and they eat it, they'll have a certain perception of how much food is on that plate. And when they're done, they'll have a certain level of, of satisfaction that goes with it. If you give the same person smaller plates, they'll serve themselves smaller amounts of food. But at the end of the, the eating, they'll feel just as satisfied. In fact, if you ask them to estimate how much food they've consumed, it'll be almost the same. Well, that leads to the obvious question, how can you outsmart your unconscious mind? Because if you've decided to go on a diet finally, it's probably a decision some people make frequently, even when I decide that, I find myself grabbing a donut, if it's laying out there, grabbing a donut 10 minutes later. Is, is that my unconscious to have me do something that 100,000 years ago would have been good for me? That's exactly right. In fact, that perspective of the 100,000 years ago is, uh, I think, a, a good one to consider at the outset. So humans have been around for about 300,000 years, and through most of that time, when there is a sudden food shortage, the people who tend to survive, the people who survived and became our ancestors, were the people who ate as much as they could whenever the food was available. This unconscious system is... It's annoying if you're trying to reduce your calorie intake and lose weight, but it's been responsible for survival across many generations. There are a lot of tricks that you can use to influence this unconscious system. So I talked about the plate size example. There's a, a large body of research on how to put together food packaging so that people will eat more of the food that's in those packages. If you buy some a bag of M&Ms or Oreos, some sort of a snack food like that, it'll be hard to find one that doesn't have a window that lets you see the food or a big colorful picture of that, that food item that's there. This inner two-year-old that drives your eating seems to not have object permanence or snack permanence in a way. If you take the things out of that container and put it in an opaque container, you'll snack far less. The study methods that usually are, are used here is participants will show up. We're going to ask you to just watch a series of video clips, and we want you to rate how good you think they are. It's going to take a while, so here's some snacks you can have if you'd like. If those snacks are in a clear bowl, people eat about twice as much as if they're in o an opaque bowl. If they're equally hungry in the two situations, the food consciously, in every case, people know the snack food is there, but this unconscious system, it's as if it can't see it when it's in, a, in an opaque container. I'm going to repackage all my snacks in black garbage bags. Peter Vishton, I'm glad that your unconscious allowed me to talk to you today. It's been very interesting. <laughs> me too. Me too. It's nice to talk to you, Seth. Peter Vishton is a psychologist at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Thanks.
thanks to the brains who know what they're doing when they help us make a new show each week. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff and operations manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Sholsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including investigating possibly biofriendly moons of the outer solar system. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the Big Picture Science episode, Your Brains Reigns. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because your unconscious has made that decision for you, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and if you listen to our show via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, throw in some faint praise, and then email it all to Big Picture Science at SETI.org. So let me see if, if I have this correctly. A hundred bells and we get two florins. Yea, that is true. But prayeth, can we not take it to the next level? Why, not a soul has reached the three florin level. Indeed, good woman, let us go with for it. Carry on, Bessie, carry on. 